Let's take our Bibles now and turn to Mark chapter 11. Mark 11 and find verse 12, if you will. Mark chapter 11 and find verse 12. While you're turning there and finding your place, can I introduce my family to you, uh, my wife and our youngest son. Would you mind standing right there? There's my wife, Sherry, my son, Jonathan. Uh, We have two others in college. We have one other married. And uh, at this point, I would appreciate any comments saying, you don't look old enough to have one married. Um, (laughs) Pastor said something about, wow, you're going to get, you're probably getting ready for being grandparents. I almost punched him, um, <laughs> but uh, no, uh, I, I love the idea of grandbabies, but not at age 47. I don't know, I just, I would either have to go buy a Corvette or something, I told him, <laughs> to, to have to deal with that crisis, uh, but it is great to see your children grow up, serve the Lord, and uh, marry the one that the Lord has for them, and it's a tremendous thing. But it is certainly uh, thrilling to be here. Uh, we're very, very thankful for the, the entire uh, week that God has set aside to be able to meet together for the whole purpose for you and I to draw closer to him. When we are revived, God will certainly draw us closer in a more an intimate and a unhindered fellowship with him. And I believe that this week that's what he wants to do. If you are going to miss a service today, make it this one. Okay. Some, some of you got it. <laughs> but let me encourage you tonight, uh, two services specifically, to definitely not miss. Tonight's service and Monday night service. That's kind of unique, isn't it? You would think, well, why, why, don't, why not every service or one particular? But tonight's service and tomorrow night. And I think it's much because of what the Lord's laid on my heart for those two messages, especially for tonight and then tomorrow, and laying the groundwork. Monday night is, a, is an important night, especially because it is uh, a week night. We normally do not meet together. Uh, for instance, on a Sunday evening we do, uh, but Monday night is unique. Could I encourage you to do something unusual? Just to say, we're going to be here. Whether or not we normally come on a Sunday evening or we normally come on these special conferences and revivals, we're just going to be here. Make that concrete decision. And uh, I believe the Lord would have uh, something uh, certainly for you. Does God have anything in mind this week? Does God have anything planned? If so, I don't want to miss it. Do you? I don't want to miss what God would have for me. And I believe there's uh, great things that he has in store for us. Um, this morning in Sunday School, I mentioned just a, a few items on the book table there. Uh, we have a couple more of those prayer books and also the devotional book back there. There's also the several of the DVD, Will I See You in Heaven? This is an excellent DVD to use as a gospel witness. If you've ever invited someone to church and they've not come, or you wanted to get through the gospel with someone or a family member, but you haven't been able to present the gospel, Let me encourage you to think about getting a handful of these uh, to be able to give out to people that you know, uh, that you are burdened for. Uh, Unlike a tract that you can give to anyone uh, that you would meet throughout your day, but let me ask you to pray about and think about specifically who God could put on your heart that you could give a gospel DVD to. In today's time, so many people are going to DVDs or videos. Could you imagine getting online right now and Googling how to go to heaven? I just went to YouTube and did that recently. By the way, Google says uh, by 2020, 85% of what we're going to consume on the internet is going to be video. It's incredible. And with all of this in mind, it's vitally important that we have videos that would present the gospel. And so very, very important. Uh, But I'll tell you more about that throughout the week. One lady that shares her story there is a Hindu lady. It's incredible. Immediately after she trusted Christ the Savior, one of our revival meetings, she came out from talking to the counselor, and uh, she was beaming. She was so excited about trusting Jesus Christ and being saved. She said, oh, preacher, I want to be baptized. I said, now, wait a minute. Baptism doesn't wash away your sins. She said, I know. I just trusted Jesus as Savior, but I want everyone to know I am no longer Hindu, but I am Christian. Isn't that good? And several stories on there how God's changed her life. And uh, so if you're here today and you don't know uh, how and what the Bible says and how to be able to go to heaven, you can today. We're going to share that. There's also a book back there called Bible Facts About Heaven. 
There's a lot out there about um, stories or testimonies of someone that dreamed or, or had an after-death uh, experience. But the truth is, what does the Bible say? What are the Bible facts about heaven? Excellent. But I've given this book away scores of times because of the chapter in there, How to Know for Sure You're Going to Heaven. There's other materials back there as well, and everything that comes in goes directly back to the ministry. But I specifically want to mention things that could help you in giving out the gospel to others as well. Uh, we're looking forward to this week, and we're praying that God would do a work. Let me ask as we begin, as we're just even at the very outset, do you want to be different? Do you want to change? Or would you be happy with how you're living right now the rest of your life? If God had something he could do for you, would you be willing to trust him for it today? Some in here, perhaps, I don't know where you're from, what, what situation, what brought you here today, but some in here, you're looking for eternal life. You don't know how to go to heaven, and God wants to give that to you today, and I'm here to explain it to you. There are many in here that already know that you're saved, you're on your way to heaven, but God has so much more in store for you. Will you be willing to trust him for it. As we look at Mark 11, would you stand with me if you're able to stand out of respect of God's word and find verse 12. The Bible says in Mark 11 and find verse 12, the Bible says, that, and on the morrow when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. He is speaking of Jesus was hungry and seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. This is an important sentence. And his disciples heard it. Look, if you would, skip down to verse 20. It records the following day. Verse 20 says, And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. The title of the message this morning is Expecting the Impossible. Expecting the Impossible. Let's pray. Father, you're all-powerful. You're a God of wonders. You're holy, you're righteous, you're incredible, and Lord, we worship you. We, we are so inadequate to be able to even give you glory and worship you properly because you're so omnipotent and glorious. Lord, I pray that today that you get us a little glimpse of your all-powerful might and help us to trust you. Lord, each one that does not know Jesus Christ as Savior, may they be saved today. Lord, I ask that each believer here, that you want to change, you want to do a work in their life. Lord, I pray that you convict, Lord, without apology, that you would bring us to faith to expect the impossible in our lives. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. As a pastor of a small church was leaving his house one evening, he said to his family, I'm, I'm going to the church. And uh, as he was going to the church, he said, I'm going to the church to pray for rain. And his daughter said, well, why, Daddy? Why are you going to the church to pray for rain? You see, there was a drought through the whole area. It was a farming community in this rural area. They were experiencing an incredible drought, and their crops were failing. Farms were failing, and the farmers were going to lose their entire existence if they did not have rain. So on an off night, they met together to pray for one thing, rain. As he was getting ready to leave, he almost closed the door when she asked her second question. She said, but Daddy, where's your umbrella? He was going to the church to pray for rain, but he wasn't taking his umbrella. There's something else he wasn't taking. He was not taking his expectancy. We're going to learn this morning that faith expects God 
to do what he says, even if it means the impossible. Faith expects God to do what he says, even if it means the impossible. As we look at this story, we see Jesus going to the fig tree. It's dried up. I'm sorry, it's not dried up yet, but it's not having figs. Now, it's interesting. He's hungry, and it says that in verse 12 and 13, it says the time of figs was not yet. So it's not even the season for figs. I understand with figs, and I've never even, I don't think, even seen a fig tree that I know of, but the leaves are fairly large, and they actually would cover the fruit. To be able to see the, the fruit that's underneath that large leaf, you would have to go over and lift that leaf to see if there's any figs. But it's interesting, he would go when the time of fig, figs was not yet. I'm from Indiana, um, and uh, a farming area, uh, certainly for corn and soybean, and we would never go out in January or February and wonder, where's the corn? <laughs> the time of corn was not yet. It would be in the fall, in the, this time of year, harvest time. But he lifts to, to see if there's any figs. There's no figs. And he curses the fig tree. He says, no man eat of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples hear, uh, all of his disciples hear what he says. And then the following day, look if you would at verse 20. It says, in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And, Paul, and Peter calling to remember and said unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou curses is withered away. He is not saying a declaration of great faith. He expected this to happen. He is shocked. In other words, he's saying, Lord, look, what you said actually took place. And he's amazed. How often are we doing the same thing? You know, Jesus never talks about the fig tree ever again. But he goes into three lessons of faith. In verse 22, we see the command of faith. In verse 23, the life of faith. In verse 24, the prayer of faith. These are the three lessons of faith we need to learn today. Look at the first lesson in verse 22. It says this, And Jesus answering said unto them, Can you read the next four words out loud? Ready? And said unto them, Have faith in God. The command of faith, four words, very clear. Have faith in God. This imperative of the command of faith is because they were omitting faith. They were not having faith. They lacked faith. What is going to stop you from getting to heaven? Not obeying God's command. Of faith in him now some people says say this in order to go to heaven you have to do a lot of good things and if you do a lot of good things then your good things will outweigh your bad things all those sins that you've committed that would keep you to he from heaven but no let me present to you today very clearly that it is unbelief in Jesus Christ God's perfect son that will keep you from everlasting life the Bible says this for by grace are ye saved through faith not of yourselves, not of works, and it says not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, it says, for by grace you saved through faith. It doesn't say through doing good works, through a lot of hard effort. Romans 4, 5 says this, to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Notice it says, to him that worketh not, not to him that worketh a little or worketh a, a whole bunch to try to earn his way to heaven, but to him that worketh not, that simply believes on Jesus Christ. This is seen very clearly in the Gospel of John. You're in Mark. Would you turn with me to the right? And if you don't have a Bible, would you grab one of the Bibles in front of you, one of the black Bibles in the pew, and find John chapter 3. John chapter 3 and so, so very important. Find verse 15 as you find John chapter 3. We're going to see very clearly, in order to have eternal life, everlasting life in heaven, it is a matter of believing in or on Jesus Christ. It is faith alone in Christ alone. Look at John chapter 3 and verse 15. The Bible says this, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So it's the person that believes he will not perish. That means to die and be separated from God in the place called hell. Why would anybody be separated from God in the place called hell? It's because of sin. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. The Lord looked from heaven to see upon the children of, 
uh, of men, and he said they're all together become filthy. They've all gone astray. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. God, who is perfect, looks down from heaven, and he sees every single sin that you've ever committed against a holy, perfect God, and he says one word, filthy. We think that we could do good things and clean up our heart or clean up our life, and we still have those filthy sins. There's only one thing that could forgive us of our sins. There's only one thing that could cleanse us from our sins, and that is the blood of Jesus Christ. Will you trust him today? You see, because of our sin, we deserve to be separated. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is what? Death. You know what death means? It means separation. Physically, when you die, your soul is separated from your body. Spiritually, death is separation from God. Eternal death and separation would be separation from God in the place called hell, the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. You see, that's what we deserve. But God loved us so much. Look at verse 16, a familiar verse that many of us know. Look at verse 16. Want to read it out loud together? Let's do it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Notice it's believing again. Not perish be, to die and be separated from God, but to believe on Jesus Christ, and you'll have that eternal life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God wants to rescue you from your sin and the death penalty. And that's why he sent Jesus. God's only son who left heaven to came to earth to die for our sins. He was the only perfect substitute dying in our place as a sacrifice for our sins. When Jesus died for our sins, he died for all of them. If he paid for all of them, how many are left for you to pay for? None, because it's already paid for. Uh, let me illustrate for ladies. If, if I were to buy a gift, if, if your husband were to buy a gift for you ladies or somebody else would buy a gift for you, would you uh, say thank you so much for that gift and where did you get it? Oh, at this store, that's great. Would you get in your car, go to that store and pay more money for the gift they already bought? There's no lady in their right mind that would do that. <laughs> you look for the clearance racks. <laughs> you look for the discounts. You're keen shoppers, and when it's paid for, it's paid for. You don't go pay more money for it. Look, Jesus already paid for all of your sins when he died on the cross. Will you believe? Verse 18, the Bible says this, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. What is it that you need to do today in order to have eternal life, to know for sure that you're on your way to heaven? It is faith alone in Christ alone. The only one who could take you to heaven is Jesus Christ. It is not this church. It is not this pastor. It is not this evangelist. It is Jesus Christ alone who died for all your sins, paid for every one of them, was buried, and he rose again. If you believe, you're not condemned. But if you have not yet believed, right now, your state before God is condemned already. I wish that wasn't true, but it is. I wish I didn't have to say anything about eternal separation from God, but it is a reality. People are there in hell right now because in their lifetime, they did not believe on Jesus Christ as Savior. One last verse on this. Look at verse 36, John 3 and verse 36. It says this, he that believeth, now the next word is very small, but very important. He that believeth, what's the next word? On. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Let's stop right there. How does someone believe on Jesus? Well, that helps us right there. Believing, Bible believing is dependence. It's relying upon or it's depending on something. If I were to sit in the chair, I would depend upon it. Ever since you came into the auditorium, of course, we've been standing and sitting, but you've been sitting where you are. You depend upon your seat to take your weight, to be able to hold you, to be able to hold you in that position. You depend on it. Believing about something would say, well, that chair can hold you up. That chair is pretty sturdy. That chair can really do it, Brother Miller. 
and I talk about the chair, I sing about the chair, I go walk around the chair, and, and I look at the chair. <laughs> but I believe about the chair at that point. When I'm believing the chair is when I do what? I sit on it. I believe on the chair. Will you believe on Jesus Christ and depend upon him? Because if not, what does it say in verse 36? Let's finish the verse. It says this, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. But he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Would you see right now before a holy God, there is no way you could forgive your own sin or right your own wrongs. Only Jesus Christ could forgive you and give you that everlasting life. And it is depending upon him, acknowledging I'm a sinner. I deserve to be separated from you, God. I believe Jesus died for me and I'm trusting you as Savior. Will you do that today? Before this service is over, we're going to give, any, give you an opportunity to make that decision. It is not being baptized. It is not giving money to this church or any other religious organization. It is not being a better person. It is not becoming a member of this church or this assembly. It is truly, simply, faith alone in Christ alone, believing on Jesus Christ. Will you make that decision today and trust Christ? Here is the command of faith. God says, have faith faith in God. Have you obeyed the command of faith for salvation? If you're saved and you know, you know you've trusted in Jesus Christ alone, can you say amen? amen? You know what? That's a wonderful thing, and that's a great assurance to have. If you don't have it today, you can. In our text in Mark chapter 11, we see the second lesson. Not only do we see the first lesson, the command of faith, have faith in God. That obviously starts with trusting Christ, God's Son, Jesus Christ, for salvation. That's the command of faith. But notice that as a Christian, we continue to walk by faith. Verse 23 is the speaking of an application to the life of faith. Notice the life of faith in verse 23. It says, For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast in the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. And that's incredible. Is Jesus really saying what he's saying here? Is this really true? He's talking about a mountain. Now you look up commentaries and ones that would give their suggestions on what Jesus is talking about, and they say, it's not really a real mountain that he's talking about. Well, let me ask, did he talk to a real fig tree and curse that? Yeah. I have no indication from the passage and for what Jesus is saying that this is just an application. Now, we can't apply it, but he's talking about moving mountains. You know what that is? That's impossible. There's no way you can move a mountain by speaking to it. And there's no way I can move a mountain by talking to it. You know what Jesus is saying? It's saying this, is this life of faith is an impossibility, and, but I can do those impossible things if you simply trust me. Who is this life of faith for that can experience these impossible things? Well, first of all, let's say, let's see who, what faith is not and, and who it does not include. Look at the word. There's two words I want to point out in verse 23. It says, for verily I say unto you that whosoever, do you notice that? Whosoever. And then notice in the last phrase of the same verse 23, he shall have, what's the next word? Whatsoever. So there's whosoever and whatsoever. This morning, we're going to see this. The faith has no exclusions. Whosoever here can trust God for whatsoever you need in your life. You know, what does, uh, what's the age group? What's the type of person that Jesus uses as an illustration, an example for faith? Is it the aged doctor the uh, well-educated scholar? Or is it, except you become as a little child, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. It is that child. Why? Because as a child, a child takes God at his word. A child just simply believes you if you tell them the sky is green. <laughs> In reality, it's blue, but they'll just trust you. You see, would we, like childlike faith, trust the one that will never fail us, that will never lie to us. And he says this, 
in this building right now, whosoever, you can trust God. You do not have to be a preacher. You do not have to be in full-time ministry. You can trust God right now. You do not have to be saved for 20, 30 years. You can trust God right now. Whoever it is, you can trust God. If you're here and you've not trusted Christ as your Savior, you don't have eternal life, you can trust Him. You say, well, I don't have that kind of faith. It's a simple type of faith, like you would sit on your chair. That wasn't difficult. You trust the chair. The focus isn't on your faith. The focus is on the object of your faith. Spiritual faith is dependence upon God and what he has said every single time. Whosoever includes you. In fact, if you were to take notes today and, and begin a list, if you will, uh, of all the people that are not included in whosoever and all the things that are not included in whatsoever, that list will be very short. In fact, it'll be blank. Because whosoever means anybody for whatsoever. Now, it does say mountains here. It does talk about mountains. Uh, I don't know too many mountains in Florida. Uh, there are very many. Do we need to go out and experiment and say, well, let, let's go find a mountain. Let's go up to the Smoky Mountains and see if this works. <laughs> no, although I believe he's talking about mountains, you know what would really help you not moving the Smoky Mountains? But let's go ahead and apply to some mountains in your life. You know, as we live as Christians, sometimes there's things in our life that seem so large, so big, they cannot be moved. Some people think, there's this one sin that's in my life, Brother Miller, I'm just going to have it until I get to heaven. Do you know that's a lie? You don't have to live that way? There are men that think, there's no way I can have a pure thought life. There are Christians who think, God's not going to hear my prayers. There are ones here today that think there's bad habits and strongholds in your life that you could never break the chains of. Addiction or discouragement or battles or those besetting sins that just keep coming back and keep coming. You get victory and come back to it. You confess it and you come back to it time and time and time again. Is there any hope for those mountains in our life? I present to you today, yes, there is. The Bible says, with Christ, all things are possible. With God, he is the God of the impossible. We can trust him. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. That, of course, is within the realm of the context of Scripture and what God is commanding us. But God wants to set us free from those things. But there are ones in here, and there are strongholds. You know what a stronghold is? Whenever you have a stronghold, it's when the enemy has a foothold or a, a territory that's on yours. It's your territory, but he has possession of it. And you think, I can't get it. Well, specifically, spiritually, what's a spiritual stronghold? A spiritual stronghold always takes place when there is unbelief in the life of the Christian. You don't believe God can use you to win souls. So there's a stronghold there. You don't believe that God can help your family. We're going to be talking about our relationships this week. God can really help your marriage, your children. There's a stronghold. You don't believe you can get victory over any sin. There's just one thing you're going to always struggle with and always battle with. And there's no way I can be free from that. There's a stronghold. Is there mountains that need to be moved today represented here i believe yes there is this week would you say dear god there's some mountains that i need moved and i can't do it i'm part of the whosoever and you said whatsoever lord i'm trusting you to move a mountain in my life but not only do we see that faith has no exclusions faith is expectancy Faith expects God to do what he says, even if it means the impossible. Notice in the middle of the verse, it says, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast in the sea and shall not, it starts with the letter D, one little word. It's, it will stop you in your tracks. It'll paralyze you in your Christian walk. It'll hinder you from going forward. It says this, that shall not, what in his heart? Doubt, doubt. That little word, doubt. I used to think that doubt came when someone did not hear God's word. 
Doubt does not come when you do not hear God's word. Doubt comes when you hear God's word and you question it. Did God really mean that? Did God really say that? Does that is that really true for me and my life? You see, do you notice in verse 14, and his disciples heard it. The disciples heard what Jesus said, but they doubted and they were shocked when God did what he said. This matter of faith does not pull something out of the air based upon our, our strong desire. Faith always looks to God's word. It sees what he has said and what he has promised. It expects him to do it even in the adversity, even if it means the impossible. Will you today trust him and not have doubt? Are you doubting God in an area? Can I illustrate it this way? Uh, what is that playground equipment? It usually is on a pivot point like this, and it's wooden or it's metal, and it goes like this. What is it called? Seesaw. Okay, we'll go with seesaw. You, some people call it teeter-totter, so that's why I asked. It's a seesaw. Okay. So up and down, right? Pretty simple. I remember in second grade, uh, there was a girl that wanted to play with me. And all girls have cooties in second grade. Would you agree with that, elementary children? And uh, all girls have cooties, that's for sure. And uh, Leslie, I'm sure she's a fine lady now, but I didn't care for her then. And uh, she wanted to play. And uh, I was pretty skinny as a second grader. You know, I was like this. And uh, she was rather healthy as a second grader. And uh, she said, and she was bigger than me. All girls are bigger than boys at that age. And uh, she said, play with me. I said, no. Play with me at recess. I said, no. Play with me. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and uh, so I, I went out and I played with her. So I got on the teeter-totter first. And so, <laughs> yeah. And so I get on the teeter-totter and I get on this side and I go ahead and proceed to sit down. When there's only one person on the seesaw, then it places the weight down on this side and that side, of course, goes up. So I'm sitting there, and now comes Leslie. Boom, boom, boom. Wasn't quite that bad. <laughs> she gets ready, she straddles it, and then she sits down. Boing, my body flies to the, no, I didn't fly through the air. But now it's stuck this way. My legs are dangling in the air. <laughs> I can't get down. So I proceed to bounce. <laughs> Bouncing's not helping. Bounce again, it's still not helping. So I, I ask a buddy to come, and another, and a whole bunch. <laughs> and, uh, you know, what's going on at this point? It, it's just like our faith and our fear. On, on one side we have fear, on the other side we have faith. And our faith sometimes seems so skinny, so little. But the fear seems so big and overwhelming. Boom. And it weighs it down. What weighs down fear? It's right in the middle of the word, or the verse, doubt. Where it's not that you don't hear God's word. You hear it and you question it. You challenge it. You hesitate to trust God. That's what's weighing down your fear. Fear in prayer, fear in soul winning, fear in getting victory, whatever it is. And it's paralyzing your Christian life from going forward. So it weighs down the seesaw on this side. But what weighs down our faith? Faith comes when you hear the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, by hearing the word of God. What takes place? What is it that weighs down our faith? Now, I'll say the word, and it's going to sound wrong. Conviction. It's when we are convinced. That's what conviction means. Convinced that what we're hearing is true. When we say, I don't care what my feelings say, I don't care what my experience says, I don't care if I failed as a Christian before, I am going to trust what God says to move this mountain. It weighs down our faith, and when our faith is weighed down, our fear is helpless and rendered powerless. Today, which way are you in your Christian walk? Is fear weighed down by doubt, or is your faith weighed down, convinced that God can do the impossible in your life? Not only do we see the command of faith, of trusting Jesus Christ as Savior, the life of faith, of trusting him to move those mountains, but finally, let's see the prayer of faith in verse 24. Verse 24 says this, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. There's so much in this verse, but notice this, 
is when you pray, believe. And it's at that transaction time when you believe in your prayer. It's not the multitude of prayers just saying the words. It is that belief in prayer. Just like when someone trusts Christ as Savior, it is not a wording or phraseology of a prayer that saves them. It is their faith. It is the believing on, believing in Jesus Christ. As a Christian, would you say, dear God, my prayer life needs to go. You see, when we obey the command of faith, it's naturally going to lead us to the life of faith, of living this life of faith and seeing God move mountains. And when we're obeying God in the life of faith, it'll naturally spill over into the prayer of faith. And you can ask God to do things that you never thought were possible, and you can see him do it. Will you pray believing this prayer of faith believes before it receives? Will you trust him? I remember when we were in North Carolina for revival meetings, I went out to my truck, diesel truck at the time. It was a, it was a Ford, and, and I, I went to, you had to turn it, let the glow plugs warm up. It was cool out, maybe 40 degrees or so, and I went to start it, and it wouldn't start. And, oh, man, I tried it again. It wouldn't start. We had had, for a number of months, a cold start problem with our truck. So I began to pray. I said, Lord, would you help our cold start problem? And right in the middle of my prayer, I'm all by myself, I was convicted. Is it wrong to pray for a truck? I don't believe so. We were using this vehicle to, to travel in the ministry that God's called us to do. It wasn't wrong. But I was convicted because I knew we needed a new truck. But I only had this much faith to fix the existing truck. I said, God, would you help me? And immediately he brought to mind the book Prayer, Asking, and Receiving in several chapters in there. And then he also brought to mind Mark 11, 24. Let's read it again. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. And I said, okay, God, I'm convinced that from your spirit, upon your word, that I should pray for this, and you're going to answer, but on one condition. Everything in our, our life and our ministry is depreciating in value. We have no home uh, or how regular house. We have a, a fifth-wheel trailer that we live in and a truck and a car, and that's it, and everything depreciates. I said, Lord, in order for this to, to really be the case, Lord, I'm asking for a new truck, but I'm asking for it to be 100% paid for. Did I just ask what I think I just asked? Well, you probably had several thousand uh, saved up, didn't you? No. As uh, that night I prayed, folks, this was a number of years ago in our ministry, probably for the, one of the first times I really sensed what it was to know ahead of time that God heard and was going to answer my prayer. I left that night knowing God heard my prayer based upon his promise and his word, what he said. Went to bed saying, God, God you're going to provide for us a truck. The next morning, I got up. I remember I went down the three steps of our trailer. As I went down the three steps of our trailer, I then turned and I looked, and you know what I saw? The very next morning in that parking lot, the same broken down old truck. <laughs> you say, wait a minute, that's kind of anticlimactic. <laughs> yeah, it is. But when I saw it, I said, I know, Lord, that last night you heard my prayer. Very long story short. <laughs> a preacher came to me and said, hey, you're in the need of a new truck, aren't you? I said, yes. He said, well, how about this? What, do, what if I write a letter to all the churches you've been in and ask them to prayerfully consider giving? I said, okay, well, let's think about it and pray about it. And as I prayed about it, God said, no. I don't think it's wrong, and there are ones that do so. But on this particular occasion, in essence, he was saying, Chris, did you pray? Yes. Did you believe me? Yes. Will I answer? Yes, Lord. Okay, don't send out the letter. Interesting, I met with him a week or two later. I said, I don't believe the Lord's in it. He said, I thought the same thing after we talked. I thought, well, maybe I could call, uh, use a phone call, you know, and, and call people instead of writing letters. God wouldn't let me write letters. Maybe I could do a phone call. Hi, Brother Miller here. Want to, want to pray for us about our truck? God said, no, don't make any phone calls. 
did you did you pray? Yes. Or then believe. There was never one huge gift, but there was an anonymous gift of two hundred dollars. Someone would call and say, "Hey, how's your ministry?" We, Lord, just put us on your heart, and then five days later, we get a check for $800. Then another church would, church would just take it, an offering out of the blue for us. We didn't ask them. We didn't spread the news. We didn't tell them. It was incredible. As over an 18-month period of time, God provided all of the funds for a new vehicle. We had one last one on the east of the Mississippi that could fit our budget. And I remember going to the the, the dealership and signing the check and paying for it and driving back to our trailer and our kids running out of the trailer and they say, look, look at the truck that God gave us. <laughs> look at the truck that God gave us. It was months later, we're driving that truck down the road and we're talking about some missionaries who needed a vehicle. One of my sons in the back, who's in college now, he said, what's that? He said, the missionaries, they, they need a vehicle. I said, okay. He said, uh, and we're talking about it more. He said, they need a vehicle right now? Yeah. And he said, well, why don't they just ask God for it? Simple childlike faith. Hey, folks, what's on your heart? What do you need God to do this week in your life? Who do you need to reach? Who's away from God? Let me ask this morning. Why don't you just ask God for it? Would you step out in faith? This morning, going into this week of revival meetings, let me ask you to do one thing. Will you pick up your umbrella to expect God to do what he says, even if it means the impossible? Let's pray. Father, I ask for your help right now. Lord, I ask that you would work in our hearts and our lives, that we would respond to you in faith and in simple humility with heads bowed, with eyes closed. This is the time of the service which, in which we call the invitation, where we invite you to make a decision based upon the truth that you heard. If you're here, I'm going to ask a couple of questions, especially about eternal life in heaven. And I'd like to pray for you by asking you in just a moment to raise your hand. I will not call you out by name, but I will pray for you. I'm going to ask Pastor to join me and it's just going to be myself and pastor that will look to see who we can pray for that would be in need of these areas. Let me ask, first of all, if you're here and you say, Preacher, I have never trusted Jesus alone to be my Savior. I always thought it was you be good or you get baptized or you go to church. But I see today that I need to believe on Jesus Christ, not just believe about him, but I need to believe on him to save me. If you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, can you raise your hand just right now? Let me pray for you. Raise it high enough where I could see it. If you're in the